Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic's going to be. Joining me this week, it's Han Birch. Hello, long time no record. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh. was, that, was, that was almost English. Yeah, almost. Well, it's good to have you back though. It feels like it's been far too long since you've been on the show. Yeah, well, I thought you know, I would, I would show, I would show a little bit of loyalty, and then I'd wait until you got really famous, and then I'd ride your coattails. Well, you're going to be waiting quite a while if you're waiting for me to get famous, because yeah, that's not really happening anytime soon, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I've just got to give it another push. <laughs> well, maybe having you on again will help, and you know, people will come back, and they'll be like, "Yay, hands back," and it will, it will give us that boost. And then we'll see what happens. But then, but then, you know. Then when you do get famous, you can't say that I wasn't there from the beginning. So, you know, you have to stay friends with me. It's a perfect plan. Just sit here and I'll get my royalty check one day. Uh, not from me, you won't. <laughs> Before we get into our story, I just want to take a moment to talk to you about The Cosplay Journal, a new coffee table magazine by friend of the show, Holly Rose, focusing on the diversity and craft of cosplay. The Cosplay Journal is out now, and I've read the first issue. It's a great read, full of informative articles and beautiful photographs. I'm a geek myself, but I'm not a cosplayer, yet I still found a lot in this magazine to give me a deeper look into this part of geek culture. The book has craft-focused articles on sewing, armour building and makeup, as well as some interviews with some incredible cosplayers, some professional, some simply being the perfectionist amateur. They ask, are cosplay guests worth it in their opinion piece article, and have a handy guide for cosplayers on how to survive a con, which is advice worth reading even if you're not a cosplayer. The Cosplay Journal is available now. You can find it on Amazon for just $9.99, so make sure you pick up your copy today so that you don't miss out. Okay, I am going to try really hard to get these pronunciations right here at the start, because oh, some of them aren't easy. Are you starting off by being racist? Well, I really hope not. <laughs> I'd like to think I'm never intentionally racist. You know, as a white person, I don't get to say what is or isn't racist. And I really hope I never do anything that is. But if ever I do, I'm I'm sorry. I, I, it's not really who I am or what I mean to do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, if somebody asked me about you, I wouldn't go, yeah, she's a racist. Well, not being described as a racist is always a good thing to hear. It wouldn't be the first thing out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not the first thing. Yeah. Like, seventh or eighth thing, that's that's fine, but you don't want it to be first. Okay, let's see if I can get these pronunciations then. Sarah Sorcher Bartman was born sometime in 1789 at the Gamatus River in what is now known as the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Her father was from the Khoikhoi tribe, and her mother came from the Bushman or San tribe, the oldest tribe in South Africa. I remember, uh, I remember learning about the Bushman, the Bushman of the Kalahari. Really? Yeah, because they, they have um, very different physiology. Let me see if I can remember this. They have, they, they have, they have something different with their eyelids because they live in a very sandy environment. And and I really hope I really hope that this is true because if it's not, this is just going to make me sound so weird. Um, I know there are certain things that stand out about them. I don't know about the eye thing though. No, 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 no. The next thing. No, no, no. no the eyelids is definitely true. The eyelids is definitely true. But I'm pretty sure they also have extra fat in their buttocks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can confirm that bit is right. <laughs> okay. Cool. Phew. Don't worry, if it hadn't have been true, I'd just cut it out anyway to save you looking a bit silly. I didn't 
no 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 I just no no I just thought like that is that, like that, you know that's one of those things that it's like I'm pretty sure I'm correct about this but if I'm not and I have just invented the fact that because it's all about um food it's all it's all about because they're hunter gatherers and uh and they don't and you know so they need they need it, it's all about basically f- food storage basically is 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 why is why it happens um but then i was like if if that's not the case that and i've just made that up out of some dark corner of my mind well no you did all right you came to this with some knowledge from before and you taught me a fact i did Sarah grew up on a colonial farm where her family worked as servants. Unfortunately, her mother died when she was aged two, and her father, who was a cattle driver, was killed by Bushmen when she was in her teens. Sarah went on and married a Khoi Khoi man who was a drummer, and they had one child together, but he did die shortly after birth. Okay. Due to colonial expansion in South Africa, the Dutch came into conflict with the Khoi Khoi tribe, and as a result, their people were gradually absorbed into the labour system. Is is um labour system euphemism for slavery at this point? Um, yeah, kind of. It's a bit more complex than just straight up slavery. I, I do get into that in a bit, though. Okay. Were they more like indentured servants instead? Do you think? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it was slightly different mm. for people from their tribe. But I've not been able to find. You know things that explain why certain certain groups were enslaved and her people were just indentured servants. Right. So I I don't really understand what's happening there, but yeah, you know it's just, it's still slavery. It's bad. Are you are you, so so you so you're going on the record? Eccentric Earth podcast is anti-slavery. You just want to put that on the record right now. You you you're, you're comfortable with that, are you? Uh, yeah, pretty comfortable saying that. I I hoped it was something that wouldn't need to be on the record, but okay. Just in case there was any doubt. Yeah, and, you know, just to get ahead and make sure that the record is, is clear going forward. Yeah, um, slavery bad, racism bad, uh, homophobia very bad, transphobia bad, ableism bad. Vaccinations good. Yeah, definitely vaccinations good. Vaccinations do not cause autism. If they did, fuck you for not wanting an autistic child. Yeah, and fuck people who support Trump. Uh, fuck people who are on the side of Nazis. Um, yeah, basically, if you're a dick, fuck you. How many listeners do you think we just lost? I would hope none. You know, we've had political views expressed on this show before from both myself and guests from things that have been sort of triggered from the the topic, you know, things that are slightly relevant and you know, we haven't shied away from how we lean on this show, so hopefully no one's left because they're like like us or those people have left already, but if this is your first time listening and you've suddenly gone, "Oh, I don't like these guys and and their political views and they said fuck Trump." Well, yeah, fuck off. We I don't care. Yeah, I'd like to say zero, and if not, bye. Yeah, and we are going to cover some things at some point that are more in line with those kind of views. And, you know, we are going to take the piss out of some of these insane views like vaccinations cause autism or Trump is a brilliant person. And like at some point we're going to do the KKK and it's not going to be from a wow, aren't they brilliant point of view, it's going to be, look how fucking stupid these guys are with their stupid D&D names and their racism. The episode title is not going to be, yay, KKK. Exactly. But if we did decide to come down on the good side, we could call it KKK. yay KKK. <laughs> Damn, why didn't I think of that? Oh, anyway, we should get back to Sarah. So currently, so she, so... After her parents died, did she continue working at the same place? Uh, yeah, she did. Um, right. However, um, when she was 16, her husband was murdered by Dutch colonists, which means by 16, both her mother, father, husband and baby have all died. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> 
it seems like these stories always have this kind of stuff happen to people early on. And I know life expectancy wasn't very long back then, but still. Well, that doesn't make it any easier just because you, you, you're pretty much certain that everyone you know is going to die young, does it? No. Soon after, she was sold into slavery to a trader named Peter Willem Cesar, who took her to Cape Town, where she became a domestic servant to his brother. As someone of Khoisan descent, she could not be formally enslaved, but still lived and worked alongside enslaved blacks. It was here that she was given the name Sarah. So although they were allowed to earn money, they were also allowed to be sold. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's slavery. Just a different name, but it is still basically slavery. Yeah. Not, not. However, however they packaged it, it's still not letting humans. Not still not treating humans like humans. Is it? In 1810, Sarah met English ship surgeon from the Royal Navy, William Dunlop, who is a friend of Cesar and his brother Hendrick. Dunlop, who had a sideline business in supplying showmen in Britain with animal specimens, became convinced that money could be made from Sarah. Oh no. Oh, human zoos. Oh, yeah. Okay. <sighs> Dunlop believed he could make money from Sarah because women from her tribe were known to have a lighter skin tone with very developed hips and large buttocks. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There is just something so ludicrous about about it's not just because it's black it's not because it's not just because they're black it's because they've got massive asses <laughs> what yeah that's pretty much their reasoning i mean i know your logic is entirely illogical but oh don't try and apply logic to racism han you'll be here forever no no you just end up with a headache dunlop suggested that sarah travel to england to make money by exhibiting herself in shows by exhibiting her bottom <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Sarah immediately refused, but Dunlop persisted, and Sarah said she would only go if Hendrik Cesar came too. He also refused, but became ever more in debt, in part because of unfavourable lending terms, because of his status as a free black. Oh, so Cesar, sorry, Hendrik Cesar, who she was being a servant for, is black, yep. Oh, okay. You didn't mention it before that moment, did you? I didn't miss it. No, no, it hadn't come up. You didn't, you didn't miss anything. No, okay. All right, okay. So there's, oh, so there's this entire, so there are free black people. There are the coys who can't officially be enslaved, mm -hmm. but pretty much are. Yep. And then there are black slaves as well. Yeah, there's a few different tiers. It's really a complex Thing they've got going on there. Very complex system. So it's not... Okay. Finally, on October 29th, 1810, Cesars agreed to go, and Sarah signed a contract with Dunlop. She was to receive a portion of earnings from her exhibitions and be allowed to return to South Africa after five years. According to an English law report on 26th of November 1810, an affidavit supplied to the Court of King's Bench from a Mr. Bullock of Liverpool Museum stated, Some months since Mr. Alexander Dumlock, who he believed was a surgeon in the army, came to him to sell the skin of a camelopard, which he had brought from the Cape of Good Hope. Sometime after, Mr. Dunlop again called on Mr. Bullock and told him that he had taken, on her way from the Cape, a female Hottentot of very singular appearance, that she would make the fortune of any person who, sh who shooed her in London, and that he, Dunlop, was under an engagement to send her back in two years. Oh, I'm right. I was slightly worried that he was trying to sell the body of the lady, but so he's told this... Bullock that he only has her under contract for two years but she's signed a contract for five years so I don't get his angle on her. no I I don't understand the the difference there unless it's you know he's he's trying to rent Sarah out to this other guy's show for two years and then keep her on for another three I I don't know okay carry on 
Cesars and Dunlop brought Sarah to London in 1810, and the group lived together in Duke Street in St James, one of the most expensive parts of London. Dunlop exhibited Sarah in the Egyptian Hall of Piccadilly Circus on the November 24th, 1810. Dunlop thought that he could make money because of Londoners' lack of familiarity with Africans and because of Sarah's large bottom. Sorry, I was... Hey, come on, Han. This is the whole reason for bringing her in the first place. No, I know. No, I, I yeah, and I'm and I'm pretty sure that this is going to work. I'm pretty sure that Americans are going are going to go. Uh, Americans, sorry, Londoners are going to be like, have you heard about the woman with the gigantic bottom? We must go to the. We must go and see her. I've never seen anything quite like it. For two shillings, from 1pm till 5pm, people could witness Sarah displayed as animal-like and exotic. <laughs> On stage, she wore skin-tight, flesh-coloured clothing, as well as beads and feathers, and smoked a pipe. Is it her flesh colour, or...? Um, I assume so, because I think that they want to make her look like she's sort of naked. She was so naked, yeah. go for that. She was forced to show off her bottom in a cage that was about a metre and a half high. <sighs> Wealthy customers could pay for private demonstrations in their homes, with the guests allowed to touch her. What? So it, so it, so it really isn't. So it really isn't because, because she's African or because she's black. It is really because she has a giant ass. Yep, they just want to stare at her huge ass. Oh... And they were allowed to touch her. You mean Dunlop gave them permission to touch her? Because I'm pretty sure she didn't. Her promoters nicknamed her the Hottentot Venus, with Hottentot, now seen as derogatory, then being used in Dutch to describe the Khoi Khoi and Sand tribe, who together made up the peoples known as the Khoisan. A handwritten note made on an exhibition flyer from the time by someone who saw Sarah in London in January 1811 indicates curiosity about her origins, and probably reproduced some of the language from the exhibition. Thus, the origin story should be treated with some scepticism. It said, Sorcha is 22 years old, 4 foot 10 inches high, and has, for a Hottentot, a good capacity. What the fuck does that mean? I mean, because nowadays capacity means, you know, whether you have the ability to make your own decisions. Um, I think that's kind of what it means. I haven't found any other sort of thing it could really mean other than them talking about, oh, yeah, she's got good mental capacity. But it makes it sound like she. he's like, oh, it's, it, it sounds like, you know, that Times version of Junk in the Trunk. <laughs> um, That's also possible. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised as well if they're sort of bringing up her mental capacity as in she's quite smart for a black person kind of point of view. Like the whole racist white people are more evolved and therefore black people are stupid Victorian era mentality. Wouldn't surprise me. She lived in the occupation of a cook at the Cape of Good Hope. Her country is situated no less than 600 miles from the Cape, the inhabitants of which are rich in cattle, and sell them by barter for a mere trifle. A bottle of brandy or a small roll of tobacco will produce several sheep. Their principal trade is in cattle skins or tallow. Beyond this nation is another, of small stature, very subtle and fierce. The Dutch could not bring them under subjugation and shot them wherever they found them. And it is assumed that that came from... The exhibition, that information was garnered. Yeah, they thought it came from the show. Hmm. The tradition of freak shows was long-standing in Britain at this time, and historians have argued that this is how Sarah was first displayed. Violence was also said to be part of the show. Violence towards her? Um, yeah, I assume towards her. I don't think they'd be violent to the audience. Well, no, because, but, it, I mean, I, I, in some human zoo situations they would have like you know fighting demonstrations right okay but it sounds more like yeah bring your stones to throw at the freak more kind of violence is how it sounds to me but yeah fucking human zoos for crying out loud yeah no again very firmly on the let's not exhibit people 
Her exhibition in London, just a few years after the passing of the Slave Trade Act of 1807, created a scandal. This is in part because British audiences misread Hendrix's ours, thinking he was a Dutch farmer from the frontier. Scholars have tended to reproduce that error, but tax rolls at the Cape show he was in fact a free black. An abolitionist benevolent society called the African Association conducted a newspaper campaign for her release. Zachary McCauley led the protests. So, so they mistakenly thought that Hendrix was a slave. So then they intervened to try and get Sarah freed. Yeah, pretty much. They decided that they're going to help her. Okay. By not asking her. Uh, yeah, she's both black and a woman. Why would they ask her opinion? They're white men. Oh, yeah. They know better. They know what's best. They know what's best. I forgot. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how often I forget that, being a white person. Cesars protested that Sarah was entitled to earn her living, stating, has she not as good a right to exhibit herself as an Irish giant or dwarf? Cesars was comparing Sarah to contemporary Irish giants Charles Byrne and Patrick Cotters O'Brien, who were both in freak shows. That makes sense that she was in the freak show life then, doesn't it? Because if he's staying, in, if he's staying with her, how would he know about those two random people from the freak show? I don't know. Macaulay and the African Association took the matter to court, and on November 24th, 1810, at the court of the King's Bench, the Attorney General began the attempt to give her the liberty to say whether she was exhibited by her own consent. So we went all the way to court before they asked her? Yep, they jumped straight to court rather than ask her what's happening. How can the court decide whether she's whether she's free or not? I, I, I don't... Well, they've got some very interesting evidence in court. And, you know, they're actually going to ask her and let her speak for herself. Oh, OK. So they do think it was... All right. So somebody <laughs> finally goes, hey, hey, I've got a revolutionary idea here. She's got good capacity, you know. She might be able to answer <laughs> you. In support, the Attorney General produced two affidavits. The first was from Mr Bullock of Liverpool Museum, which we heard earlier which was intended to show Bartman had been brought to Britain by persons who referred to her as if she was property. The second was by the Secretary of the African Association, described the degrading conditions under which she was exhibited and also gave evidence of coercion. Sarah was questioned before an attorney in Dutch, in which she was fluent, via interpreters. However, the conditions of the interview were stacked against her, in part, again, because the court saw Cesars as a Boer exploiter, rather than seeing Dunlop as the organiser of the whole venture. Oh, what? Thus, they ensured that Cesars was not in the room when Sarah made her statement, but Dunlop was allowed to remain. Oh, beautiful. Yes, beautiful. Historians have stated that this cast doubts on the veracity and independence of the statement that Sarah gave. Really? Why would they think that? I have no idea. <sighs> she stated that she, in fact, was not under restraint, did not get sexually abused, and that she came to London of her own free will. She also did not wish to return to her family and understood perfectly that she was guaranteed half of all profits. The case was therefore dismissed. I don't know what to say. Well, if it makes you feel any better, this is probably the best... The story's going to be at this point. Oh, please. Um, I've got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> I've just remembered that I can't record tonight. Isn't that weird? <laughs> uh, yeah. um, the fact that, I mean, her statement doesn't state what questions she was asked. No, no, there's no information about what they actually asked her. No, no, I'm not being sexually abused. <laughs> So the people who were trying to to trying to free her, who thought that she was perhaps being held against her will, coerced, sexually assaulted, um, all of that stuff, didn't think to question the veracity of her story, considering the circumstances of the interview. They just dropped it at that point and went, OK. Yeah, it's I guess in, in some ways it was out of their hand because the the attorney said, OK, no, we we take her statement as fact and 
you, I kind of want to deconstruct that and think, well, no, it probably was a false statement to a certain degree because Dunlop was in the room and she's a black woman being put on show by a white man. So there's probably something dodgy going on, but it, it is possible as well that things were kind of above board and that she was aware of what was going to be going on. She had a contract to say that she'd get half the profits. Maybe she did. And, you know, it's the Victorian era. Maybe people seeing her in her skin tight, flesh coloured unitard thing thought, oh, she's naked. And then the story spun out into, you know, sh she was being molested or being promiscuous and stuff like that. So I don't know, maybe it is something dodgy. Maybe it isn't. I, it's it's hard to, to know, really. Yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult, you know. Uh, I mean, I I don't know whether this comes into the story later on, whether it's just it may be just the kind of lines I've drawn, but you know, she, the fact that she asked her de facto owner to come with her makes me think that maybe they had a closer relationship than slave and than slave and owner for a start. Mm. Um, that maybe they they were involved and so she ended up so in that case you know maybe she said you know again maybe 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 yeah. but you know if she's in a relationship with him and he gets in debt and then she says well well i have a way of earning money i'm not going to like it but i am going to do it you know that's a, that's also a possibility but then you also don't know if she wasn't then thought that she was signing up for one thing and then she gets there and she's told that she has to wear a and and dance in a cage um, and, and I, and I hate to say that considering the lack of agency that women were given, you know, the amount of agency that, 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 that women were given, the amount of agency that black people were given, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to err on the side of pretty sure she wasn't that happy. The publicity given by the court case increased Sarah's popularity as an exhibit. She later toured other parts of England and was exhibited as far as Limerick Island in 1812. She was also exhibited at a county fair in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. So, something of a celebrity for the time. Yeah, how many Twitter followers has she got? Um, considering Twitter wasn't around, probably not that many. <laughs> Where's your proof of that? Um, my guess i don't have proof that they didn't have it well there you go then you make an assertion it is up to you to prove it after four years in britain in september 1814 sarah was transported from england to france and upon arrival hendrix Azars sold her to an animal trainer um <clears throat> so at this point it's pretty obvious that she's not doing what she wants to do since he's just sold her yeah she's now been sold i i I don't know if there was stuff going on beforehand, but yeah, this is where it takes the turn. Well, considering that he he tried to sell her to the to the Liverpool Museum dude before she even got there, I, I'm not willing to give this Dunlop dude the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Sorry, guy. Uh, no, this wasn't Dunlop. This was Cesar's who sold her. Oh, Cesar sells her. Yeah. Oh, technically, yeah, because technically she's still his property. Oh, fuck me. Oh, and so did Caesar just sell her and then fuck off then? Yeah, from what I found, he just went back to South Africa after selling her in France. Oh, lovely. Glad to know that this is a, an equal opportunities show for scumbags, though. Yep. Unfortunately, just because someone is black doesn't mean they're beyond selling another black person for money, apparently. Good old scumbags in history. We like to feature, yeah, scum scumbags of every colour. Her new owner, an animal tamer named S. Rio, exhibited her under more pressured conditions for 15 months at the Palais Royal. In Paris, her exhibitions became more clearly entangled with scientific racism. French scientists were curious about whether she had the elongated labia, which earlier naturalists such as Francois Leviant had purportedly observed in Coisson at the Cape. <laughs> That's a very innocuous way of saying that he looking at native pussy yep the fascination seems to have moved from her bottom to her front bottom now as well to her front bottom so i wonder whether they decided to wander this as merely a theoretical thing or whether they 
wanted to test their supposition. Um, well, we will develop along this storyline and you'll find out where it's going to go. Oh, I, I kind of have a theory where it's going to end up already. Yeah. Um, please don't go. F- finish the story. No, I'm not. No, I'm not going to. And I, I'm, I'm just holding out desperate hope that this isn't going to end up with her stuffed corpse being exhibited somewhere. But I, I'm, I'm willing to lay money. That's where it ends. Um, you'll have to wait and see. I didn't say how much money. <laughs> French naturalists, among them Georges Cuvier, head keeper of the menagerie at the Muséum National de Historique Naturelle and founder of the discipline of comparative anatomy, visited her. Do you know what? Le Muséum Historique de, de Naturelle. That means Natural History Museum in French. Mm, okay. Yeah. Blew your mind, didn't I? Um, eh. <laughs> Sarah was the subject of several scientific paintings at the Jardin du Roy, where she was examined in March 1815. As saint Hilaire and Frédéric Cuvier, a young brother of George, reported, she was obliging enough to undress and allow herself to be painted in the nude. This was not literally true, though, Although by his standards she appeared to be naked, in accordance with her own cultural norms of modesty, throughout these sessions she wore a small, apron-like garment which concealed her genitalia, and steadfastly refused to remove it, even when offered money by one of the attending scientists. Which makes you wonder how this other naturalist saw so many labia. Uh, I doubt it was through legitimate scientific reasons. Well, yeah, especially because I'm not entirely sure, um, but, you know, during the, uh, especially during um, the, you know, the, the 18th century, and this is, this is very, very, very early 19th century, that, you know, science and that was, was not a profession. It was something that you did as a hobby. You know, you were a gentleman scientist. Yeah, it it wasn't really a real profession at that time. It was, you know, I've read a few books and I'm curious about these issues and topics. I'm a scientist now. Yes. Cuvier concluded that Sarah was a link between animals and humans. Ah. Thus, Sarah was used to help emphasise the stereotype that Africans were oversexed and a lesser race. Oversexed because... Because people from her tribe have bigger bottoms and long labia. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Ryu began exhibiting her in a cage alongside a baby rhinoceros during her public performances. Is that how the scientists came to the conclusion that she's the missing link between animals and humans because she was in a cage with an animal? Considering the level that these so-called scientists are working at, it was probably a contributing factor, yeah. Her trainer would order her to sit or stand in a similar way that circus animals are ordered. Well, uh, sorry, I thought for a second there that you were saying that, so her trainer isn't the baby rhino's trainer. No, Sarah has her own special trainer. Nice. At times, Sarah was displayed almost completely naked, wearing little more than a tan loincloth. And she was displayed in a loincloth. Lovely. There is also some evidence to suggest that she was made to wear a collar around her neck. Why? To further dehumanise her and make her look like an animal, of course. I was worried that would be the answer. It is believed that she drank and smoked heavily to cope with the humiliating ordeal. Mm. It has also been reported that during this period, she engaged in sex work in order to earn money due to her shows becoming less popular though there is no evidence to support these claims that I've been able to find. Though I imagine if that was the case, it probably wasn't her decision, but something Rio made her do. Yeah. If she was exhibited in a cage, did she really have the freedom to go and, and go and be a a prostitute by, you know, know, go and set, go and be a sex worker to, to earn extra money or was she told? On December 29th, 1815, Sarah died at the age of 26. What? She died of undetermined inflammatory ailments, possibly smallpox, while other sources suggest she contracted syphilis or pneumonia. 
Whilst the decision was made not to perform an autopsy on Sarah to attain the cause of death, Cuvier was granted permission by Rio and the police to conduct a dissection for scientific reasons. What? 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 Are, are you kidding me? Yep, they don't care why she died or want to get to the bottom of that. They just want to cut her up to study her and prove their theories. Oh, snap! Oh, snap! Is this the vagina that was on display for, until, like, the 1970s? Um... Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, no! Oh, fuck me sideways! <laughs> wrong thing to say right then but <laughs> yeah i'm i'm sorry oh it's actually worse than stuffing her it's actually so much worse <sighs> sorry for spoiling for for spoiling that french anatomist henry marie de crotav de blainville probably pronounced wrong but who cares de scum published notes on the dissection in 1816 which were republished by George Cuvier in the Memoir du Muséum de Historique Naturelle in 1817. Cuvier, who had met Sarah, notes in his monograph that its subject was an intelligent woman with an excellent memory, particularly for faces. In addition to her native tongue, she spoke fluent Dutch, passable English, and a smattering of French. Almost like, you know, she was a human being. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Hmm. I wonder what other surprises this human being body has in store. He describes her shoulders and back as graceful, arms as slender, and her hands and feet as charming and pretty. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh! He adds that she was adept at playing the Jew's harp, could dance according to the traditions of her country, and had a lively personality. Despite this, Cuvier interpreted her remains in accordance with his theories on racial evolution as evidencing ape-like traits. He thought her small ears were similar to those of an orangutan and compared her vivacity when alive to the quickness of a monkey. <sighs> in addition to the dissection, Cuvier made a plaster cast of her body and pickled her brain and genitals and placed them into jars. Not even an autopsy, but a full-on dissection. <sighs> yeah, they they didn't even want to know why she died or investigated it at all. They just wanted to use her for their own scientific ends. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I plan on giving my body to, to medical science when I die, but I'm consenting to that <laughs> for a start. Yeah, and it's completely different as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't equating it in any way, shape or form. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I know. It's it's one of those things, if you leave your body to medical science, you're doing it for a reason. It's your choice. You want to help progress medicine and science and all that. But she didn't do that. She That wasn't her wishes. And they just desecrated the poor woman. Yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah. That, that is, that is, that is the correct word to use. She has been desecrated. Yeah. After Sarah's death, Geoffrey saint Helier applied on behalf of the Museum de Historique Naturelle to retain her corpse on the grounds that it was, of, was a singular specimen of humanity and therefore of special scientific interest. The application was approved and Sarah's skeleton and body cast were displayed in the museum until her skull was stolen in 1827, but subsequently returned a few months later. I kind of... I don't... I don't know. Do you think... Did someone do that for shits and giggles, do you think? Probably. The, you know, the fact that this girl came back a few months later is like, what other reason would there be? It's still fucking weird, though. Hmm. People. The restored skeleton and skull continued to arouse the interest of visitors until the remains were moved to the Musée de la Homme where it was found, when it was founded in 1937 and continued up until the late 1970s. Her body cast and skeleton stood side by side and facing away from the viewers, which emphasised her large buttocks, while reinforcing that aspect as the primary interest of her body. The exhibit proved popular until it elicited complaints for being a degrading representation of women. 
The skeleton was removed in 1974 and the body cast in 1976, more than 150 years after her death. And not because, yeah, I mean, and it was also removed for the wrong re- I mean, the wrong re- Would you argue that it was removed for the wrong reasons? Um, I, I guess, I don't, it's weird, it's... It's a good reason to take something off display if it's degrading to women and it's insulting. Yeah, take it off display. But this is also a woman who was enslaved and lived through all these horrible things. And then her body was taken against her wishes and cut into pieces and put on display. It's like that should be a higher reason to take it off display. But yeah, sure, prioritise the it's degrading to women reason, I guess. But it's, but it's kind of low on the list of, of reasons why that why that shouldn't have been there in 1976. Or even 1876. Or even, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, should never have been done in the first place. During the period between 1814 and 1870, there are at least seven scientific descriptions of the bodies of women of colour done in comparative anatomy. Cuvier's dissection of Sarah helped shape European science, and Sarah, along with several other African women who were dissected, were referred to as Hottentots, or sometimes Bushwomen. These savage women were seen as very distinct from the civilised females of Europe, and thus 19th century scientists were fascinated by the Hottentot Venus. Even though she spoke four languages... Yep, she spoke four languages, but they still considered her a savage, and less evolved. (laughs) Sarah was considered a freak of nature, and her organs, genitalia, and buttocks were thought to be evidence of her sexual primitism and the intellectual equality with that of an orangutan. They described her large buttocks and the unusual length of her labia to be signs of lesser evolution in all black women. Yay! Scientific racism! A poem was written in 1878 by Diane Ferris, herself of Khoisan descent, entitled I've Come to Take You Home, and played a pivotal role in spurring the movements to bring Bartman's remains back to her birth soil. The poem reads, I've come to take you home. Home, remember the veld? The lush green grass beneath the big oak trees. The air is cool there and the sun does not burn. I've made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buchu and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white and the water in the stream chuckles sing songs as it hobbles along over little stones. The case gained worldwide prominence only after Stephen Jay Gould wrote The Mismeasure of Man in the 1980s. Mansell Upham, a researcher and jurist specialising in South African colonial history, also helped spur the movement to bring Sarah's remains back to South Africa. So they tried to start getting her home in the 70s, but it wasn't until white men got involved. Uh, Yeah, although it didn't really get off the ground until the bit I'm about to get into. After the election of Nelson Mandela as president of South Africa in 1994, the Khoi people's first request from him was for the return of Sarah's remains, and as such, he requested the repatriation of her remains and Cuvier's plaster cast. Mm -hmm. The French government, however, refused to return Sarah's remains to her home, stating that they wanted to conserve their national collections. I mean, I would say I would say some scumbag France, but it's exactly what fucking we've done and still do. You know, our, all our all our museums are full of stolen goods. After much legal wrangling and debates in the French National Assembly, France acceded to the request on the sixth of March, two thousand and two, eight years after the request was first made. Oh my god! Two thousand and two. The French government had a carefully worded bill drafted that would not allow other countries to claim treasures taken by the French in the same way. (laughs) I was going to say, yeah, to make sure that all the stuff that they perceive is worth money. Yeah, I dare say the only reason they gave Sarah back was because she wasn't on display and therefore they weren't actually making any money from her. Yeah, we're only giving her back because we feel she's worthless. Yeah, like, she's only just taking up space in the back room, really. 
Taking up space, yeah. The then Minister of Research, Roger Gerard Schwarzenberg, said, This young woman was treated as if she was something monstrous, but where in this affair is the monstrosity? According to South African politician Thabo Mbeki, the monstrosity lie in the matter of the gross abuse of the defenceless African woman in England and France. Yep. It was not the abused human being who was monstrous, but those who abused her. Yep. It was not the lonely African woman in Europe, alienated from her identity and her motherland who was the barbarian, but those who treated her with barbaric brutality. Mm-hmm. And isn't that generally the case? Yeah, it's pretty much always the so-called enlightened and advanced civilizations who are almost always the worst. Yep. Her remains were finally repatriated to her homeland, the Gamatus Valley, on the 6th of May 2002, and were buried on the 9th of August that same year, the 9th of August being National Women's Day in South Africa. She was buried on a hill in the town of Hanke over 200 years after her birth. Sarah became an icon in South Africa as representative of many aspects of the nation's history, the Sorcha Bartman Centre for Women and Children, a refuge for survivors of domestic violence, opened in Cape Town in 1999, and South Africa's first offshore environmental protection vessel, the Sarah Bartman, was also named in her honour. I don't, I never know how I feel about things like named in her honour. It's like, that's a, that, that, I, I, yeah, it's a nice thing, but you shouldn't have had, yeah, but you shouldn't have had to have named something in her honour. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. There was something interesting about this, though, that um, I I did see in some research. Mm. Yeah, um, I didn't really know where to fit it into the story, though. Okay. So she was brought to England as a curiosity and a sideshow attraction because of the fact that she was, like, slim waist and regular kind of proportions at the top, and then... She had the large bottom and people sort of went and viewed her and mocked her and ridiculed her and kind of, they they fit it to their scientific racism that she was less evolved because of her body shape. And people are kind of pointing out the fact that after that, that's when Victorian women started to copy that body shape in the way they dressed with like a corset and bustle. <laughs> Like, I I don't know if it's true, but if it is, it's just infuriating the fact that they they mocked and ridiculed this woman and treated her as less than human and then went and copied her. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I'm, I've just I've just go, I've just wikied bustle. The bustle in its creation owes much respect to the late Sarah Bartman for the planting of the vision of this design. Oh, OK. So, yeah, it is. It is true then. Uh, yeah, there's there's three references saying that, yeah, the, the bustle in its creation owes much respect to the late si- Sarah Bartman for the planting of the vision of this design. And then there's three references. OK, OK, no, right. The third, OK, the third reference, which obviously I'm not going to click on. Before you, cl- before you click on it, it gives you the link. Dailymail.co.uk article. And this is the headline. The 19th century Kim... Hot and top Venus's big bottom sparked global scandal. Two hundred years, certain Miss Kardashian. So they basically called her the nineteenth-century Kim Kardashian, and used the term "hot and top Venus." Well, if you want historical inaccuracy and blatant racism, of course, go to the Daily Mail. They're fucking cunts. Ah, okay. Um, Journal of Social Sciences. Uh, the, the Sarah Bartman's Body Shape versus the Victorian Dress, The Untold African Treasures is the title. Um, ab- abstract. Um, this article examines the relationship between the Victorian bustle dress that became popular from 1870 onwards and the unique body features of Sarah Bartman, an African slave who was displayed in Europe against her wish from 1810 to 1815. So if it didn't become famous until 1870, that does lend more credence that they that it was in inspired by her rather than happened before her well that kind of it it does seem like that's true then yeah oh goodness gracious i've just found a cartoon from the time oh oh no 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 don't 
don't Google search her. The, the pictures are awful. Oh, no, it's actually it's in an article. OK, fair, fair enough then. Well, Han, if people enjoyed this episode and want to find you online, where can they do so? Have you got anything that you want to promote or or plug? Uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. No, I mean, you, you can feel free to add me as a friend on Facebook. I mean, I generally just post random memes, occasionally political things, mostly just things that make me laugh. I'm not that interesting a person, really. Having known you for a few years, I can confirm she is not that interesting. <laughs> I did post. I did post some. Um, you saw what I posted earlier today. I did. Yeah. I was going to be. I was going to be very, very derisive in the way in the way I described it, and then realised that the listeners don't don't know me and don't understand that I sometimes do these things and don't mean them. So that's that was a really rowdy way of saying. I was about to say I posted titties on Facebook, but but. When you see the titties that I posted, you'll understand why. Why it was the opposite of objectification of women? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't really objectifying women at all. But I, I saw it, and I got to be honest, I didn't think uh, either. Oh, there, there's a really pretty woman, or wow, those are great tits, or even that's a hot guy. The first thing I thought was her hair is amazing. <laughs> what? It's true. It was like different shades of blue and green it was awesome she does have really really good hair i i have to say that i did go political commentary first like good political commentary and then i went he's very pretty <laughs> oh well if the listeners enjoyed this episode you can find eccentric earth online you can go to twitter at eccentric underscore earth we're on facebook at facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth and we're on Instagram at eccentric underscore earth. If you want to write in with any suggestions for future episodes or to get in contact with us for any reason, our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com. You can find the show on all major podcast providers and on YouTube. So please make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please leave us some feedback because it does help us find new listeners. Well, Han, thank you very much for coming back on the show. It's been really good having you back on. Thank you for having me. Uh, can it be something more cheerful next time? Um, yeah, I'll I'll make sure it's something a bit lighter next time. I think I think you've earned it with this episode. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for listening, and we will catch you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.